Okay, today we're going to talk about some more information about the corporations, and this mostly is going to focus on earnings and profits and distributions and how to treat them, how they affect the, the shareholder, how they affect the corporation. So let's see what we can do with it. Um, uh, first thing, uh, talking about the things when a corporation makes a distribution, there's a trouble that's related to that uh, double taxation, whereas um, the corporation can't deduct dividends or distributions that are made from a corporation are normally called dividends, uh, assuming they're made from earnings and profit. And um, they can't deduct that that distribution of, di of a dividend, but the taxpayer, the shareholder has to pay tax on it. So uh, what happens is the corporation has to wind up paying tax before they make the distribution. Then the, or the same year they make the distribution, they pay tax on the earnings that produce the ability to pay the dividend, and then the taxpayer, uh, the shareholder taxpayer, has to pay tax again on their div on their distribution um, because dividends are taxable. And so we talked about already in a previous chapter the fact that the, um, the individual shareholders can get a preferential rate many times under qualified dividends, and the fact that for corporations that get dividends, they get a dividends received deductions many times, at deduction many times. And so those do mitigate the trouble, but it doesn't take it all away. And so it's still a double taxation trouble. But in any case, dividends is the main way that corporations distribute um, assets back to their shareholders. And then sometimes um, if it's not considered a dividend, it will be some other kind of distribution, which we'll talk about in this um, in this chapter. And then also stock dividends are a thing that corporations do and stock redemptions. So we'll talk about those um, near the end of the lecture. And there we'll briefly discuss complete or partial dis dis liquidations, but actually those topics are something that you could do an entire tax course about. So we're just gonna barely touch the surface and just bring to attention the fact that those are issues that have to be addressed <clears throat> in some cases. All right, and then <clears throat> there is a, a different thing called constructive dividend that we'll discuss, and that's where the corporation didn't necessarily intend to pay a dividend or a, didn't intend to report a dividend to their, to their shareholder, but some of the expenses that the corporation paid might have been for the benefit of the shareholder or deemed to have been from the IRS's perspective, and so they are being considered just the same as if it were an intentional dividend. That's because the IRS has chosen to show it as a constructive dividend, and so um, that we'll discuss that some. All right, so now let's talk about determining the dividend amount uh, from earnings and profits. So um, a dividend is just a distribution paid to a shareholder out of earnings and profits, and it could be paid from current earnings and profits from the very year that we're talking that the payment's been made to the shareholder, um, and or it could be from accumulated earnings and profits, which is just a term that means all the earnings and profits from the previous years that are still left in there. So it's a similar to the retained earnings concept but it is just separately tracked because it's earnings and profits has different rules about what counts as um, the revenue expense and what increases and decreases earnings and profits. But in any case, it is similar to the same concept as a retained earnings um, balance that comes forward every year with you. But in any case, both those, if you pay a, a payment to a shareholder from a corporation that that is less than or equal to the current earnings and profit and or the accumulated earnings and profit, then you don't have to worry about what, how to classify it. You just say that is a dividend. And so then you just reduce earnings and profit by the amount of dividends you paid, and you just keep moving on with a new accumulated earnings and profit that has been reduced by those dividends. Okay, so, but there is a complication when, um, when distributions are made in excess of these earnings and profits. So that's what causes us to have to dig a little deeper. Um, but extra distributions over earnings and profits, whether it's current or accumulated, requires you to form this, uh, file this form 5452. And basically, those distributions are tax-free up to the amount of the basis that the shareholder has in them. So it's a return of capital, which that's why it's tax-free. It's a return of capital. And then anything in excess, once you've passed earnings and profit and you've passed the cost basis, the any excess over that would be treated as a capital gain. Okay, so then you have to figure out how do you determine earnings and profits? 
So earnings and profits would be um, the um, would be adjusted for some of these things that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about this non-taxable income that you still have to include in earnings and profit. So here's just a few examples. There are some others, but these are the main ones. Um, municipal bond interest, as we know, it's not taxable for the tax return, but it is includable in earnings and profit. And life insurance proceeds, likewise, not taxable. That's like the key man insurance, not taxable, but it is included in earnings and profit. And then federal tax refunds that the company would get, not taxable, but it is includable in earnings and profit. Um, and then deductions that don't reduce earnings and profits, even though they might reduce income, taxable income on the return, would be like the dividends received deduction. Again, this is a partial list, but this is the most prevalent ones. Uh, dividends received deduction that a lot of companies get because they invest in other corporations and get dividends. They can, they can take a deduction to reduce their taxable income, but that is not a reduction of earnings and profits. Then the NOLs that are coming forward from previous years, those are a deduction for tax purposes, but not a deduction for earnings and profit. And then net, cap net capital loss carryovers coming from previous years, again, not deductible for earnings and profit, even though they are for the taxable income. Another one is the charitable contributions carryovers that come in coming from previous years, the charitable contributions were, limit, were limited. We talked about that in another chapter to 10% of the ta uh, modified taxable income of, of the corporation. And that excess over 10%, if there is any, would be a deductible item in the next year, as long as it's not an excess of 10% again, uh, but it would not be affecting the earnings and profits. And then non-deductible expenses that still do reduce current earnings and profit. Here's some examples of these. So this is one of the reasons some of these things weren't deductible as a carryover is because they are deductible for earnings and profit in the year of the expense. Uh, so examples of those would be the federal income tax. You don't get to deduct it on your federal return for corporations for anybody, but for corporations in particular we're talking about, but you do reduce earnings and profit by this federal income tax. And the same thing with uh, expenses related to tax exempt income. If expenses are related to municipal interest or some other taxable, uh, non-taxable income, um, you would not get a deduction for them on the, on the tax return, but you would reduce earnings and profit by them. Current charitable contributions. So this means if you pay 25% of the taxable income of the corporation, with these modifications that are required um, that in our in our charitable contribution calcs, then you would still reduce all earning, earnings and profit by all of it, even though you'd be limited to 10% on your deduction for taxable income. And then the premiums on that life insurance that we talked about earlier at the key man, um, if the amount that exceeds the cash surrender value is a deduction for uh, the increase, the amount that exceeds the increase, sorry, of cash surrender value is a deduction for earnings and profit, even though key man insurance premiums are not deductible for taxable income. And then the part that's disallowed of meals and entertainment expense, another thing that not deductible for the tax return, but it is a reduction in earnings and profit. And then uh, lobbying expense and political contributions. That's it's a little curious why these do, but it's just because they're trying to track what is left in the corporation, similar to what you would do with retained earnings. And so the disallowed lobbying expense and the disallowed political expense, as well as the disallowed expenses for penalties and fines, those are not deductible anytime for, um, for uh, not as even as a carryover for um, taxable income, but for earnings and profit, they do reduce. All right. And then some incomes that require some income items that re, or expense items that require separate accounting for earnings and profit. So many, meaning it's a timing difference between when it's deductible on the return versus when it's uh, deductible on the books. So the kind of thing that would want the, the so this category is like in the installment sale transactions, the tax rules let you take installment income when it's collected you, you report the percentage of it that is that is gross of the gross profit that is taxable and you apply that to the payments that you receive that's a the way that you report installment sale income on a tax return but for earnings and profit you just go ahead and show the entire sales if it were collected then so but basically converting to accrual basis for earnings and profit count Deferred gain, similarly, um, 
you would think, I'm sorry, it's tr treated similarly on the tax part, but not treated similarly for earnings and profit, is the deferred gain on a like kind exchange. It is not an includable item in earnings and profit. So this is an exception to what you think of when you're logically thinking, well, we're just going to go with the accrual on this or, or we'll go on the financial statement method. Uh, it's sort of like that most of the time for earnings and profit, but for, this, for the like kind exchange, you do not include the deferred gain in earnings and profit. So that's something to remember because that comes up comes up on our test, comes up on the CPA exam. So just make sure you make a note. For a gain on like kind, not includable in earnings and profit. And then the um, 179 expense, rather than taking 179 and showing that as your depreciation method, um, the earnings and profit calculation requires you to spread that over a five-year period instead as a depreciable over the five years. And also there's some methods of depreciation, the fast depreciation that are not allowed for um, earnings and profit, but they um, obviously are for tax purposes because almost everything is deducted immediately on the tax return. All right, and then construction contracts uh, are mandated to use percentage completion, even if it's a small enough organization that they could on the tax return use completed contract um, method, they have to for earnings and profit calculate on the percentage completion method. So then the cost depletion is mandatory also, no percentage depletion allowed for the earnings and profit calc, even though the taxable income can be conduct, can be um, calculated using percentage depletion. All right, and so now there's this ordering of E and P. And so what I've got here is a very simplistic overview because it's actually more complicated than this. But basically if you have positive current earnings of profit and positive accumulated earnings of profit, and it exceeds the amount of the distribution, then it's always going to be a dividend. So if you have positive, in other words, you have an accumulated earnings, um, an accumulated earnings and profit, and you have a current year earnings and profit, then you can just assume that your dividends will be shown as dividend and you don't have to re reassign their, uh, what, what their, what trend, what type of transaction it is. Um, as long as they're more than that. But if they're exceeded, then you naturally go to the typical method that I discussed earlier, which was it's first a dividend until all earnings profit is wiped out. And then if more distributions are made it, in that same period, it is a return of capital up to the amount of the taxpayers or stockholders investment or cost in the stock. And then the third piece was it is capital gain in excess of that. So that's the, the typical method that we're talking about when we say it's going to be a dividend, then it's going to be a return of capital, then it's going to be capital gain. That's when you have E&P. Okay, if you have positive current E&P, but negative accumulated E&P, then that is the same sequence, dividend, return of capital, and capital gain, but you, you just use your current E&P uh, to call it a dividend up to the amount of the ends. And then there's a con the calculations have to begin about now what are we going to call how are we going to deal with the rest of it? So it's a it's a complicated allocation if you have multiple distributions. And we'll do an exercise in another video that kind of gives you an idea how this might pan out. And so then if you have negative current ENP and positive accumulated earned ENP, as long as you have one or the other of them as positive, you're going to show some dividend because your dividend is going to be up to the amount of ENP that includes both. But and so it's not complicated if you just have one distribution or one time that you distribute. But if you have multiple distributions, it's this allocation again that I'm talking about. And so we're going to practice some of those with the exercises. The textbook also has good examples of how these work. And they have a good a summary at the end of the chapter about how this ordering of the ENP distributions happens. So basically, if you in all those situations, as long as there's some positive ENP, then dividends is going to be considered a um, a as a dividend, I mean, distributions is going to be considered as a dividend to some degree. And then it, after that would be return to capital and then um, capital gain. But um, if you have no ENP, not currently and not accumulated, which is the last scenario we're talking about here, if you have no ENP at all, then you just bypass the dividend and you go straight to, well, any distribution you make then would be a return of the of the shareholders capital and then after that it would be a capital gain. So it's going to come clear when you actually put some numbers on it and 
come clear and more complicated because the the process just takes a few minutes to get your head around once you know how it works it's not a big deal okay now then the next thing besides distributions from ENP would be um or regular this would be like cash distributions we've already talked about but then if you had some that were for that included property and cash or just property then you would have to look at it a slightly different way. And these are non-cash dividends or distributions. So for um, the effect on the shareholder would be the value of what they got and the amount that's shown as dividends to them would include the cash they got plus the value of the assets they got at fair market value minus any liabilities that were attached to those assets they were distributed. So, um, so um, the for for basis calcs, you, uh, there's my little caveat here. Uh, for basis calcs, you would just ignore the liabilities and call your basis as the fair market value in those assets that are distributed. But for pat possible for the purposes of showing the dividend that's going to be taxable, you do reduce by the amount of the liabilities that were assumed. But you would never show the in a negative. So um, it would. If your liabilities that have been distributed with the assets exceed the value, the fair market value of the assets, then you just bump up the value of the assets to be exactly the same as the liabilities. Because you can never show a distribution of assets that is in the negative position. In other words, any if you if a taxpayer, I mean sorry, if a shareholder receives an asset that has a loan attached to it, that's the loan is more is higher value than the um, fair market value you've assessed, it means you've misassessed because you're going to have to show it's worth at least as much as the loan against it. So if the value of the asset, say, was $50,000 and the loan against it was $60,000, then you would just bump up your assets value to 60. So they would net out to be a net zero. And so it would either be no distribution for taxability purposes, or it would be whatever cash you got if you had cash with it, just the cash. But if the liabilities exceed the value, the fair market value of the assets that's being distributed. So that's from the shareholder's perspective. Now, from the corporate perspective, the distributions on these appreciated properties triggers a corporate gain. So if you had an asset, say, that's that you're distributing, say that asset that we had, uh, the fair market value was $50,000. If the book value on that asset was $20,000 and we're distributing to the shareholder at this fair market value of 50, assuming we weren't oh, underwater with our liability, um, if the vast asset value was legitimately 50 and the debt against it was less than that, if any was transferred out, then $50,000 transferred out would mean it was like we sold the asset for $50,000 at the corporate level. So the corporation would have to pay tax on the difference between the $50,000 value they're distributing to shareholders and the, the basis in the corporate records, which is just net book value. Okay, and for tax purposes, net book value, in other words, carrying value for tax purposes. Okay, and so that's if you have appreciated property, the meaning it's increased in value over what its book value is carrying, what you're carrying it for tax purposes basis book value. And then this, the second category would be if you distribute a lost property, meaning its um, value is lower than its book value, you would not record the loss on that. You would just show it as a distribution and you would not actually get a deduction for the loss. Okay, and then uh, constructive dividends, moving on to the next topic. Uh, if a payment is made or a discount is granted uh, to a shareholder or to benefit a shareholder, the IRS sometimes reclassifies that as a taxable dividend, and that's what we call a constructive dividend. You don't see a, a voluntary constructive dividend, because if it was voluntary, it would just mean that the corporation recognized that they were making a distribution to their shareholder, and then they would just treat it as on non-cash distribution. And so as all constructive dividends are related to the IRS adjusting the reporting that was done on the tax return and saying, wait a minute, this should have been shown as a dividend and it wasn't. So we are gonna call it a constructive dividend and we're gonna make you pay tax. Um, the individuals pay tax on the, on the benefits they got and the corporation would reclassify it as not as any kind of expense or 
it, whatever else they classified it as, but as a dividend, which is non-deductible. So it would be the double hit. The double taxation definitely would hit if a constructive dividend is assessed. Um, okay, so here's some examples. If you had unreasonable compensation paid to the shareholder, this happens not really, really often, but sometimes where a, a shareholder is paid a salary that is unreasonably high because there was a lot of taxable income in the corporation. And so they paid it out of salary to avoid the double taxation. So IRS could come back and reclassify some of that and say, no, that's excessive. Here's the amount of, of compensation that was legitimate for this position and their and the work they performed. And so they could reclassify a $400,000 salary back down to 200 and that would leave you 200 as a dividend. So they, they have done that before. Now, if your shareholder is the sole reason for all the income that's made, it's easy to argue that the reason the compensation is reasonable. But if it's like, in other words, my example, I had surgeons over the years that made more than what some would call a reasonable compensation salary, but that would be because the, they were responsible for every surgery that was performed. And so um, that is why their salary was so high. And they had comparable uh, um, salaries they could point to in other places in the U.S. that surgeons had made those kind of salaries. So, I mean, you would have to fight and explain why your salary was that high. But there are times when it looks like an unreasonable compensation and it's actually not. But in any case, um, that's one example. A bargain sales price is another one. If the corporation owns the property and they want to sell it to a shareholder, if they gave them a discounted price of a, any kind of re, uh, significant discount, then it really would probably be more of a, here's a distribution of property and you, you can pay part of it back. But you see, that's why they would classify it as a constructive dividend. If they got a big discount, that would not have been offered to anyone outside. If it's, In other words, if it's not an arm's length transaction, that would be the same between outside parties and the corporation. Then that discount they were offered could be easily construed to be constructive dividends. That's where the construed comes from, I bet you. But in any case, another example, the same type of thing, a bargain rental or lease. If the corporation owns a building that they're not using and they want to lease it to a shareholder to use for their own business or whatever you, you say, reason they have to have the building, that discounted lease would be an income item, which would be considered a dividend because they're a shareholder relationship. Okay, then excessive rental or lease if the shareholder, on the other hand, owned the property. That's what this one's about. If the shareholder owns the property and they charge a high rental in order to get some of the income out of the corporation, that would be, if it's higher than they would charge to another party that rented the property from them, the property from them, then that would be um, considered a constructive dividend, that excess rent. And then excess interest paid to a shareholder on loans. If the shareholder loans money to a corporation instead of them going to the bank and charges a really high rate, the, part, the amount they pay that's higher than they would have had to pay to the bank is an excessive interest payment. And it could be reclassed very easily as constructive dividend. Then another one, a loan granted to a shareholder where there's no interest. And we talked about these many times in both the, the uh, individual taxation class and in this class about these below average loans or uh, um, the, um, let's see. When, if you if the if the corporation is not charged any interest, or if they part of charged a reason a very unreasonably low interest rate, then that extra is just a matter of um, I'm sorry. If the shareholder is not charged interest or charged unreasonably low, it's a, it's just the effect of the corporation giving them a benefit, and so that extra that should have been uh, shown as interest would be an income factor to the individual. And we've already been through how that affects the corporation and the individual, how the corporation would then show it as a dividend if it got reclassed, which is non-deductible, but the individual would still, the shareholder individual would still have to show it as uh, interest income. Um, all right. Oh, I'm sorry, that's when the payments to the corporations, yeah. I think I just flipped them. Okay.
Now that would be what would the, that would be the scenario that happened if you had excessive interest and you didn't show it as dividend. This dividend would not be deductible where you had been trying, the corporation had been trying to deduct the excessive interest. The flip one that we were just talking about here is where the shareholder does not have interest. And we've already been through this with the below market loans. Um, but basically the if the loan is granted to the shareholder with no interest, then when it comes down to it and they reclass it, the shareholder would be showing, um, uh, have to show interest uh, expense that they paid and they might get to deduct it. But then the, the corporation would have to show interest income that they got from the shareholder, even though they didn't accept, actually receive it. So interest would be taxed at the corporate level and at the individual level, only deductible if they could deduct it as some legitimate interest like home mortgage interest. And so not, not very common that those loans between shareholders and the corporations relate to the residents. But in any case, it could be, but just not likely. All right, so sorry about that going around by Loris. Okay, and then a payment made by a corporation to pay the shareholders personal obligations. This is actually happens all the time in small corporations where they just pay bills for the personal. And that's not right, of course. And it's that line that's supposed to be kept very distinctly that the corporation is a separate entity. And so it shouldn't be paying expenses for the shareholder personally. And so if IRS finds anything like that, they immediately would classify that as a dividend and it would be taxable to the individual shareholder and non-deductible to the court, but shown as a dividend. Um, and then um, the interest part back paid or not paid is the one that most often triggers these constructive dividend adjustments, just so you know. So that's why we pound that interest calculation business about how to calculate the interest on those below market loans. All right, and then um, the stock dividends, we don't, we'll go into this in depth. Several things here at the end of this chapter that we just kind of highlight instead of giving a deep dive because it's deep subjects. So we're just giving you attention that, hey, here's an issue right here. Um, when, a, when the corporation issues additional shares, it's usually a non-taxable event. It is possible for it to be taxable, but it's not. It's a, it would not be a normal transaction. Normally, when a company issues additional shares, they just do some kind of stock split or they do a stock dividend, and it's not actually changing the equity situation at all. It's just changing the number of shares each shareholder is holding. That's because if it's ratable, in other words, across the board, two for one, across the board, six for one even, across the board, 10% um, um, uh, um, uh, increase, um, though any of those would still have a ratable distribution. And so they would be a non-taxable event. Okay, and then uh, stock redemptions is a possibility. The corporation, in this case, would buy back the shares from some shareholders. And sometimes when that happens is when a shareholder dies and that corporation will uh, will uh, buy back the shares. It's, it's got to be a voluntary. The corporation doesn't force redemption uh, as a rule. There's some stock rights that can be redeemed like that, but stock itself normally. And see, again, I'm just barely touching this because this is very complex information and a whole t whole class could be taught about stock transactions, redeeming them, um, stock splits, stocks, um, um, stock repurchase plans, um, options, and all these very complex topics that are under this umbrella. But what we're trying to do is show you that sometimes the corporation buys back. And in some of the examples where it happens, the shareholder dies, they could, they often buy back the shares if the family does not want to hold them. Uh, and then if it, in a divorce settlement, often the shareholder will, uh, the corporation would buy back if they, uh, in order to get those shares back, if the, if the couple wanted them to, a lot of corporations would, and especially small corporations where it's not like traded on the stock exchange, just in a corporation that's independent often would buy back shares rather than risk taking on a new shareholder that's not related to the operation. And then a repurchase initiative um, sometimes is instigated in a big corporation to uh, affect the stock prices. So this would be normally someone that's a corporation whose stock is traded on a uh, on a uh, 
public exchange like the New York Stock Exchange or the American Exchange and the American Stock Exchange. But that would be because they're trying to affect the price. So if stock dips, the price of stock dips, sometimes they'll go in and scoop up some of their low cost shares in order to try to pump the price back up. And so and maybe just to stop others from being able to buy in at an unreasonably low rate. But in any case, that's, again, complex. And it's uh, the, what, the reasons that a corporation would choose to do it and timing of when they would do it, totally dependent on their own reasoning, that corporation's board and management. And so totally not trying to guess all the reasons they would do it, but just letting you know it happens. And then um, sometimes in a small business, especially, there's a, a plan for a stock redemption as part of a buy-sell agreement to accomplish a business succession that says this, we're not going to be able to continue the business the way it is. So in order to transfer ownership, rather than distributing all the assets and letting selling the business that way, we would have a buy-sell agreement with some other parties to just sell the shares and keep the organization in intact. So that's just another reason for a stock redemption. Okay. Uh, it's not sell the shares exactly. It's redeem the shares and then uh, sell them over. But keeping the organization intact as you do the transfer is what I'm saying. All right. And then li corporate liquidations, a very sticky subject, of course. Uh, but liquidating just basically means the corporate is no longer going to be there. It is dis it's just distributing all the assets. It's closing everything out. There's not going to be a legal form of that um, corporation anymore. So it triggers gain and loss on the distribution of all the assets. If there's a gain, it's reported. If there's a loss, it's reported. So that differs from a non-liquidating li uh, distribution because a non-liquidating or partial distribution triggers gain, but not loss. And the corporation continues. So any assets that had a loss, um, that would not be able to be recognized. All right, so again, not taking it any further. That's a very complex uh, topic we're talking about. All right, the last one in this chapter. This is accumulated earnings tax and it um, and personal home, holding company tax. So these are both similar. They're trying to um, discourage corporations from accumulating too much assets and not using them for operating purposes. So um, the accumulated earnings tax is a 20% excess tax on the excess over a reasonable business needs holdup of assets, hold up of assets, I should say. Um, the baseline for, term, for, for determining what is a reasonable amount of assets to hold is 250,000 um, plus specific needs you can you can specify, like maybe assets to um, for working capital needs or debt pay down or business contingencies, you have to have a specific reason why you would need to keep more than 250,000 if you're challenged. Now, a lot of corporations have more assets than this, but they know, well, they should know, they are subject to the possibility of an accumulated earnings tax upon IRS review, because it's one of those things that would come in a, in a uh, IRS adjustment because of audit, not just a random or it could be a reason they got chosen for an audit, but it wouldn't be just every tax return gets assessed an extra fee normally. It would be on review. IRS would dig, dig in deeper before they would assess it in the, as a norm. All right, so the second one, so most corporations try to keep it where they don't have a problem with that. And then again, very, very complex. We're not gonna do a big application of this. We're just gonna try to understand a general understanding that there is something like this out there. The second one that does almost the same thing, but this one's personal holding company tax, and it is an extra 20% tax too, just like the accumulated earnings, but it's an alternative too. So you, the, the IRS wouldn't assess both at the same time. If they didn't catch you on accumulated earnings tax, they might try to see if you um, should be assessed the 20% based on personal holding company tax. So how that one works is if you uh, the corporation is more than 50% owned by five or fewer individuals. So it's not like a public trade company at all. It's a small business. Um, and so then at the same time as that, if more than 60% of the corporation's income is from these passive type sources, dividends, interest, well, passive slash portfolio, um, dividends, interest, rents, royalties, and personal service income. If those are the sources of the income, 
more than 60% of the income is coming from those sources. Um, and more than 50% of the stock is owned by these five or fewer people, then the, corp the IRS can assess this personal holding company tax of 20% of their assets. So um, that is, um, that is these are both big bites because they're not really tax taxing income like normal for tax purposes. These are taxing assets, accumulated assets. So that is a, that is a, these are sad. If they hit, you're like, oh my goodness, what did I do? Why didn't I get these people to distribute this money? But anyway, you, that's just something to have a heads up about. Don't want to have too much piling up in the corporate accounts. All right. So that's all for this one. We'll come back with some exercises.